chapters fifteen and sixteen of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the golden mill three years have come and gone since the forge was built and the three misguided patriots still loyal to their vow and to the thirty-three stars on their dear old flag are sitting together in the fair sunlight of a sabbath morning on the steps of the golden mill tumbler the bear very shaggy and faded as to his mangy coat is sleeping comfortably on the dusty path that winds away to the house coleman's tawny and curly beard and the black hair on bromley's face have grown long and thick and the down which before time was on philip's lip and chin now flares out from his neck and jaws like a weak red flame philip sits a little apart from the others with the telescope in its leathern case strapped on his back and there is a look of sadness in his face and in his wandering downcast eyes three years have wrought great changes in the plateau the harvest have been abundant and at a little distance from where the men sit purple grapes hang in great clusters from the vines which have been grown from the cuttings of that solitary plant which overhung the branch on the july day when they first came down its bank with the captain of the troopers and andy the guide the building of the mill has been a work of time and it is not yet a month since bromley emptied the first yellow grist into the flaring hopper two long years were spent in shaping the upper and the nether stones and the new mill was rightly called golden for five thousand guineas from the mints of george the fourth and good queen vic were melted in the forge and beaten into straps and bolts and rings and bands for the wooden machinery gold glistens in the joints of the dripping wheel and gleams in the darkness at the bottom of the hopper where the half of a priceless cavalry bootleg distributes the corn between the grinding stones the hopper itself is rimmed with gold and the circular wooden box rough hewn that covers the stones is bolted and belted with the metal elsewhere called precious and from the half-roof of oak shingles to the slab floor gold without stint enriches and solidifies the structure it plates the handle and caps the top of the pole that shifts the water on to the wheel and the half-door which shuts out tumbler the bear swings on golden hinges and shuts with a golden hasp healthy living and abundance of food have rounded the lusty brown limbs of the three soldiers and charged their veins with good red blood but alas in the midst of the abundance of nature and the opulence of the golden mill by reason of their tattered and scant covering they are pitiful objects to look upon as they sit together in the sunlight the smart uniforms with yellow facings are gone and the long cavalry boots and the jaunty caps with cross sabres above the flat visors and so little remains of their former clothing that they might almost blush in the presence of the bear lieutenant coleman has some rags of blue flannel hanging about his broad shoulders which flutter in the soft wind where they are not gathered under the waistband of a pair of new and badly made canvas trousers having the letters u s half lost in the clumsy seam of the right leg and a great a on the back which sufficiently indicates that they have been made from the stiff cloth of the tent called a and that if required they could easily stand alone such as they were these trousers on account of their newness and great durability seem to be the pride of the colony they are certainly much smarter than philip's which are open with rents and patched with rags of various shades of blue and tied about his legs with strings and finally hung from his bare tanned shoulders under the telescope by a single strip of canvas all three of the men have hard bare feet and the tunic or gown of faded blue cloth which hangs from bromley's neck shows by its age that the overcoat capes which were sacrificed to make it were sacrificed long ago this what you may call it is girded in at the waist by a coil of young grapevine covered with tender green leaves and fringed at bottom with mingled tatters of blue cloth and old yellow lining and this completes the costume of the dignified corporal who enlisted from harvard in his junior year except some ends of trousers which hang about his knees like embroidered pantalettes 
with all their poverty of apparel the persons of the three soldiers and their clothing as far as practicable are sweet and clean which shows that at least two of them have lost none of that pride which prompted them to stay on the mountain and which still keeps up their courage in the autumn of the good year sixty nine and now let us see what it is that ails philip many entries in the diary for the fifth summer on the mountain which is just over indicate that the conduct of philip was shrouded in an atmosphere of mystery which his companions vainly tried to penetrate so early as march twelfth eighteen sixty nine we find it recorded philip spends all his unemployed time in observations with the telescope in the following april and may entries touching on this subject are most frequent and lieutenant coleman and george bromley have many conversations about welton's peculiar conduct and record many evidences of a state of mind which causes them much annoyance and some amusement may twelfth requested philip to remove one of the bee gums to the new bench instead of complying with my request he plugged the holes with grass removed the stone and board from the top and emptied a wooden bowl of lye into the hive destroying both swarm and honey after this act of vandalism he entered the house took down the telescope and slinging it over his shoulder walked away in the direction of the point of rocks whistling a merry tune as he went at another time he was asked to set the slow john in motion to crack a mess of hominy and instead of spreading the corn on the rock he covered that receptacle with a layer of eggs and hung the bucket on the long arm of the lever such evidences of a profound absence of mind were constantly occurring and if they were not indications of his desire to return to the world his secret observations with the telescope made it plain enough that he was absorbed in events outside the borders of sherman territory if questioned he assigned all sorts of imaginary reasons for his conduct and at the same time he held himself more and more aloof from his companions to wander about the plateau alone during the previous winter philip had reported that one of the four young girls removed by the confederates at the time of the capture of the officers had reappeared in the vicinity of the burned house this fact was soon forgotten by coleman and bromley who were working like beavers pecking the stones for the mill but to philip it was an event of absorbing interest where were the others what sufferings and what indignities had the returned wanderer endured in her long absence and what hardships and dangers had not she braved to reach her native valley again gentle as philip's nature was he possessed in a marked degree the power to love and the hunger to be loved in return occasionally a man in a dungeon or on a desert island or in the shadow of a scaffold has devoted himself to a one-sided passion in circumstances as baffling as those that hedged in philip the sight of this lonely girl wandering back to the blackened ruin in the deserted clearing furnished the dolorous lady his nightly fancy craved a speck in the distance he drew her to his arms in the magic lens and consoled her with such words of sympathy and endearment as his fancy prompted in short he had the old disease that makes a princess out of a poor girl in cowskin shoes and a homespun frock and had it all the worse that she kept her distance as this one did in the long days when storms interrupted his observations or fog hung over the valley he wrote tender letters to his princess on prepared leaves of his prayer-book in which the grave responses of the litany ran in faint lines like a watermark under the burning words on the paper he watched jones and the kindly neighbors not including shiftless clearing away the wreckage and rebuilding the smith house between the sturdy stone chimneys the new cabin was divided by an open covered passage through which philip could look with the glass to the sunlit field beyond and watch the princess smith entering either of the doors opposite to each other in the sides of the passage this love of philip's had sprung into being full-fledged 
without any stage of infant growth like an ordinary passion besides its unsuspecting object it was ample enough to take under its wings her wandering kinsfolk dead or alive and included the cow with the soundless bell which came to be milked in the evening by the hands of the princess herself and then to crop the grass and lie in the dust of the road until morning from the time when she waved him a banner of smoke at sunrise until the firelight reddened on the cabin window philip came to linger almost constantly on the rocks to the neglect of his share in the labours of the little community when planting time came and hands were in demand to spade up the soil his companions for the first time secured and hid away the telescope for a day for two days philip was uneasy going and coming by himself doing no work speaking to no one scarcely partaking of food at last the suspense and disappointment became unendurable and going to lieutenant coleman resting from his work in the shade of a spreading chestnut he threw himself at his feet and begged for the return of the telescope revealing for the first time the nature of his infatuation his lips once opened poor philip ran on in a rhapsody so fantastic and incoherent that the diseased state of his mind was at the same time made apparent in the diary for july six lieutenant coleman writes an unspeakable calamity has fallen on the dwellers in sherman territory reason has been blotted out in the mind of our companion philip and now we are but two in the company of an amiable madman in view of philip's malady lieutenant coleman felt it wise to humour him with a telescope and to try the effect of more active sympathy by joining him in his observations after an eager examination of the clearing in the valley gone gone he cried in a voice of despair you have driven away my princess you hate her you and the other one you hate me i'm not wise enough for your company you and the other one give me back my princess give me back taking the glass from his trembling hand coleman levelled it on the house in the clearing and happily there stood the woman midway of the passage and on the point of advancing into the light take her back dear philip he said returning him the telescope we will never steal her again i and the other one see there she is with a quick movement philip looked and without a spoken word he fell a laughing and crooning in his delight in a way so unnatural and so uncanny that it was sadder to see than his excitement the only chance of reclaiming philip seemed to be in the direction of feigning sympathy with and interest in his delusion trusting to time in the absence of opposition to bring him back to reason never after this exhibition of petulance on the rocks with lieutenant coleman did he show the slightest tendency to violence when he came in on that particular evening the lieutenant took his hand and in a few friendly words told him how glad he was that all was well and that the lost was found and ordered the flag run up in honour of the occasion philip looked in a dazed way at the flag showing that that emblem had lost its old power to stir him with enthusiasm all that summer when his expert advice was sorely needed poor infatuated philip took no more interest in the construction of the golden mill than he did on the spots on the moon he was as ignorant of the affairs of sherman territory as the princess smith that plain ignorant working girl in the valley was of his existence so week after week and month after month through the long summer and into the sad autumn days his companions kept a melancholy watch on philip who wandered to and fro on the mountain with the telescope in its leathern case strapped over his bare shoulders as we saw him first in the shadow of the golden mill scantily as the three soldiers were clad at that time they still had their long blue overcoats to protect them from the cold of winter and broken shoes to cover their feet and so in the short december days poor philip grown nervous and haggard with want of sleep strapped the telescope outside his coat and wandered about the points of rocks the morning of january ten as it dawned on the three forgotten soldiers if it may be said to have dawned at all cast a singular light on the mountain top it had come on to thaw and the time of the winter avalanches was at hand 
the sky overhead was of a colourless density which was no longer a dome and it seemed to philip as he stood on the rocks as if he could stretch out his hand and touch it somewhere in its depth the sun was blotted out ragged clouds settled below the mountain top and then borne on an imperceptible wind a sea of fog swallowed up the clouds and blotted out the valley and the ranges beyond even as it had blotted out the sun leaving sherman territory an island drifting through space philip closed the telescope with a moan and replaced it in its leathern case even the trees on the island and the rocks heaped in ledges grew grey and indistinct and presently the thick mist resolved itself into a vertical rain falling gently on the melting snow the strokes of an axe in the direction of the house had a muffled sound like an automatic buoy far out at sea philip turned with another sigh and took the familiar path in the direction of the axe groping his way in the mist as a mountaineer feels the trail in the night with his feet the sound of the chopping ceases and a great stillness broods on the mountain evidently the chopper has sought shelter from the rain brown leaves begin to show where the snow has disappeared on the path so familiar to the feet of the wanderer that no sound should be needed to toll him home but to-day while his feet are on the mountain top his aching heart is in the valley she has gone for ever from the arms of the lover she never knew he sees before him the wedding of yesterday and in his gentleness he is incapable of hating even his successful rival he is capable only of grief bitter tears fall on his breast and on his clasped hands a great aching is in his throat and a dimness in his suffused eyes he throws his arms out and presses his temples with his clenched hands and mutters with a choking sound as he walks he does not know that the rain is falling on his upturned face he turns to go back he changes his mind and advances he is no longer in the path he has no thought of where he goes the blades of dead grass and the dry seeds and fragments of leaves cling thick about the sodden surface of his tattered boots he strides on absently over the ground parting the fog and cooling his feverish face in the rain and every step leads him nearer to the bolder face of the mountain where the great avalanches are getting ready to fall a thousand feet into the cove below the events of yesterday go before him he sees the procession come out of the church house the women in one group and the men following in another and he and she going hand in hand in the advance he feels the sunshine of yesterday on his head and the misery in his heart then it is night and he sees the lights of the frolic at the cabin in the clearing he is no longer the cheerful happy philip of other years but a weakened distracted shadow of that other philip staggering on through the rain he has forgotten his soldier comrades and the meaning of his life on the mountain he has forgotten even his patriotism and the existence of the flag with thirty-three stars sherman territory is receding under his feet and the grief that he has created for himself so industriously and nursed so patiently is leading him on a blotch of shadows to the right assumes the ghostly form of spreading trees the naked branches blending softly in the blanket of the fog the gnarled chestnuts which looked like berry bushes while they waited at the deserted cabin on that first night for the moon to go down give no voice of warning and philip comes steadily on with the telescope strapped to his back and the load in his heart under his heedless feet the dead weeds and the sodden leaves give way to the slippery rock for a moment the slender figure crossed by the telescope is massed against the mist overhanging the cove then there is a despairing cry and a futile clutching at the cruel ledge and in the silence that follows the vertical rain out of the blanket of the fog goes on shivering its tiny lances on the slippery rocks chapter sixteen which shows that a mishap is not always a misfortune it was still early in the day when philip fell over the boulder face of the mountain and when the chopping which he had heard through the fog ceased at the house bromley had indeed gone in but not for shelter from the rain he had gone to warn lieutenant coleman of the absence of their half demented comrade and of the peril he ran in wandering about on the mountain in the fog 
they felt so sure of finding him near the point of rocks that they went together in that direction but before they started philip had wandered from the path and by the time they reached the rocks he had put the house behind him and was walking in the direction of the cove finding no trace of him there and seeing the dense mist which covered the valley and made observation impossible they separated and went off in opposite ways calling him by name philip philip and as they got farther and farther from each other philip philip came back to each faintly through the fog and the rain they made their way to such points as he might have found shelter under but their calls brought no response they knew that in his peculiar state of mind he might hear their voices and make no reply and in this was at last their only hope for his safety as they continued their search at twelve o'clock a wind set in from the east redoubling the rain but rapidly dispelling the fog in an hour every place where he could possibly have concealed himself had been searched and with one mind they came back to the point of rocks they lay out on the wet ledge and looked over with fear and trembling half expecting to see his mangled body below they could see clearly to the foot of the precipice and there was nothing there but the smooth trackless snow and then when they drew back they looked at each other's faces and knew for the first time how much they loved philip and how much each was to the other they were almost certain now that he had fallen over one face of the mountain or the other yesterday they could have followed his track in the thin snow but now the rain which was still falling heavily had obliterated one after melting what remained of the other they went together down the ladders and for its whole length along the base of that ledge when they returned to the plateau lieutenant coleman and bromley were tired and soaked with the rain and crushed with the awful certainty that philip had fallen over the great rock face into the cove they could neither eat nor sleep as long as there was a possibility of discovering any clue to his fate and so in time they came to the slippery rock in front of the station where the heel of his boot or the sharp edge of the telescope had made a scratch on the stone that the rain was powerless to wash out it was no use to call his name after that dreadful plunge the very thought of which tied their tongues to that extent that the two men stood in silence over their discovery and when they could learn no more they came away hand in hand without uttering a word this was indeed the point where philip had gone over the great rock but by a strange good fortune his body had plunged into a mass of rotten snow fifty feet from the brink of the precipice it was the snow of the avalanche making ready to fall and through this first bank his body broke its way falling from point to point for another fifty feet until he lay unconscious over the roots of the great icicles which hung free from the rounded ledge below him dripping their substance nine hundred feet into the cove when he came to himself chilled and sore after his great fall the moon was shining softly on the snow about him and sparkling on the ice below he had no recollection of his fall and but the vaguest remembrance of what had gone before it was rather as if he had dreamed that he had fallen upon the avalanche and when he had first opened his eyes upon the snow about him and above him he tried to reason with himself that no dream could be so real he remembered vaguely the autumn days by the golden mill and he knew that it was not winter at all and yet this was real snow in which he lay bruised and helpless he realized that he was almost frozen and his clothing that had been wet was now stiffening on his limbs the great shock had restored his shattered mind leaving a wide blank it is true to be filled in for the best part of the year that was past he was himself again now but where it was not at first so clear there was nothing to be seen above beyond the snow which hung over him but when he turned his sore body so as to look away from the mountain side his eyes rested on the long white roof of the cove post office as he had seen it often before from the top of the plateau philip knew now that he was in the very heart of the avalanche he lay on the very brink of the ice which might fall with the heat of another day's sun at first he began to cry out for help but his voice was such a small thing in the mass of snow against the great rock 
and then he thought of the people from the hills who would come at noon of the next day to watch by the post office to see him fall him philip welton and then he thought of coleman and bromley who must have given him up for dead and even of his uncle at the old mill with more of desire than he had ever felt for him before he tried to drag himself a little from the icy brink but his legs and arms were numb and stiffened with the cold he began to clap his nerveless hands and stimulate the circulation of his blood by such movements as he could make he had an instinctive feeling that the avalanche had been trembling yesterday where it clung to the great black vertical stain on the face of the boulder just below the trees that looked like berry bushes from the road in the cove he knew that it would not fall during the night he had no recollection of the rain he knew that more heat of the sun was yet required to loosen it for the great plunge it was freezing now and every hour added solidity to the surface of the snow and yet as he gained the power he feared to move as the workman distrusts the strong scaffold about the tall steeple because of its great height from the ground above him ten feet away he could see the hole in the snow through which he knew he must have fallen and as he thought of the fearful shoot his body would have made clearing even the great ledge of icicles if the surface of that bank had not been rotted by some cause his limbs were almost paralyzed with terror the thought helped to stir the sluggish blood in his veins and he shrank rather than moved a little from the awful brink where he lay gradually he rose to his feet and looked about him the cove post office showing its white roof through the naked trees that looked like berry bushes in their turn far far below him fascinated him until he felt a mad impulse to leap over the icicles to oblivion instead of yielding to this impulse however he covered his eyes with his hands until he found strength to turn his back on the tiny object that terrified him if he cried out his voice against the rock for a sounding-board might awaken the sleeping postmaster before his comrades on the plateau even in that case no help could reach him from below across the bridgeless gorge and even if his comrades were above him on the rocks they could do nothing for him should he wait there to meet certain death in the avalanche to-morrow or the next day he thought of the cool courage of bromley and wondered what he would do if he were there in his place as long as there was a foothold to be gained he knew bromley would climb higher if it were only to fall the farther and he felt a thrill of pride in the dauntless nerve of his comrade this thought prompted him to do something for himself and he began by whipping his arms round his body keeping his back resolutely on the small post office and trying to forget its dizzy distance below him as he grew warmer and stronger he felt more courage it was impossible to reach the hole in the snow through which he had come for the broken sides separated in the wrong way from the perpendicular he was not a fly to crawl on a ceiling a few yards to his right as he stood facing the mountain the bank through which his body had broken its way made a smooth curve to the ledge where the icicles began as he looked at the great polished surface of the snow the thought came to him that nothing in all the world but the soft moonlight could cling there hopeless as the passage by the bank was he could reach it and the feeling that it led away to the region above prompted him to pick his way along the narrow ledge until he could touch with his hand the smooth surface of the bank he could only touch it with his hand for the edge curved over his head as he stood alongside it he felt that the bank was hard he was unable to break its crust with his hand and he knew that every moment it was growing harder his strong knife was in his pocket he drew out this and opened it with his stiff fingers then he began to cut his way under the bank beyond the first surface the snow yielded steadily to his efforts and as it fell under his feet he made his way diagonally upward until at the end of half an hour as it seemed to him he broke the crust of the great bank and pushed his head through into the fair moonlight he looked up at the glaring steep above him and it was beyond his power not to take one look back at the tiny post office below him if he had not been safely wedged in the bank it would have been his last look in life as it was he shrank trembling into the snow and for a whole minute he never moved a muscle 
fortunately for his shattered nerves it was not necessary to go out upon the surface of the bank which was considerably less than perpendicular he had only to cut away the crust with his knife and so gradually work his way upward in a soft trench leaving only his head and shoulders above the crust philip felt a strange exultation in this new power to advance upward and all his sturdy strength came to his aid in his extremity he felt no disposition to look back at the trail he knew he was leaving in the snow he was certain now of gaining the top of the bank but what lay beyond he knew not half the distance he had fallen would still be above him he was almost up now but at the very top of the bank there was another curl of the snow and once more he had to burrow under like a mole when philip's head did appear again on the surface it was not so light as before and with his first glance around he saw that the moon was already sinking below the opposite ridge he was almost within reach of another hole to his left and by its appearance and by the distance he had come he knew it was not the same which he had seen from below and alongside it the last rays of the moon glinted on the brass barrel of the telescope attached to its broken strap how it had come there he had no idea any more than he had how he had come to be lying on the ledge above the icicles where he had found himself a few hours before it was the old familiar telescope of the station through which the three soldiers had looked at the prisoners and at old shiftless in the valley and it made him glad as if he had met an old friend he stretched out his hand to draw it to him instead of securing it his clumsy fingers rolled it from him on the smooth snow and as he looked at it the telescope turned on end and disappeared through the hole in the bank in the awful stillness on the side of the mountain he heard it strike twice it was nothing to philip now whether it fell in advance or waited to go down with the avalanche and just as this thought had passed through his mind and as he turned his eyes to the side of the cliff above him the far-away sound of metal striking on stone broke sharply on his ear and he knew that the telescope had been smashed to atoms on the rocks in the cove bottom from where he crouched now on the snow he could see the edge of the plateau above him and as near as he could judge it was rather less than fifty feet away the smooth rock was cased in thin ice so thin that he believed he could see the black storm stain beneath it it was growing dark now and after all his toil and hope he had only gained a little higher seat on the back of the avalanche he saw with half a glance that it would be impossible to climb higher he heard the wind whistle through the branches of the dwarfed old chestnut trees over his head and as the cold was so still about him he knew that it was an east wind he could go nearer to the ledge but he could gain no foothold on the rock in the midst of his cruel disappointment and his awful dread of the sun which would come to melt the snow next day he felt a greater terror than he had felt when he had first found himself down below his companions might have gone mad and thrown him over the rock it was all a dark mystery to poor philip he could barely see about him now even the sun would be better than this darkness it might be cold to-morrow at any rate it would be afternoon before the sun however warm could get in its deadly work on the avalanche it never occurred to him that he was nearly famished and he must have slept somewhere he sat in the snow for he dreamed that the people were gathered at the post office to see him fall and a crash like the roar of battle brought him to his senses with a start the next time he awoke the bright sun was indeed shining and he was stiff with the cold as he had found himself at first he was hungry too as he had never been hungry before and the fear of starvation seemed more dreadful to him than the dread of the avalanche as he lay there in his weakened state his ears were alert for the faintest sound he thought he heard a movement on the ledge above him and then he heard voices clear and distinct they were the voices of coleman and bromley poor philip he heard them say at first he was unable to speak in his excitement and then he raised his voice with all the strength of his lungs and cried help help is that you philip yes george yes help by questioning him they learned what his situation was and the distance he lay from the top of the ledge for they could gain no position where they could see him 
they bade him keep up his courage until they came again it was indeed a long time before he heard their voices again speaking to him and then down over the icy rock came a knotted rope made of strips of the canvas that remained of the a tent at the end of the lifeline as it dangled nearer and nearer were two strong loops like a breeches buoy philip felt strong again when he had the line in his hand and thrusting his legs through the loops he called out to hoist away as he went up up he clung fast with his hands to the strip of canvas but he was too weak to keep himself away from the rock with his feet so he bumped against it until he was drawn over the surface of the same stone he had slipped on the morning before he saw the kind faces of his two comrades and then he sank unconscious on the firm earth at their feet end of chapter sixteen Chapters 17 and 18 of The Last Three Soldiers by William Henry Shelton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. How the Postmaster Saw a Ghost. On the day when Philip fell into the avalanche, although it was likely to break away from the face of the mountain at any moment and come thundering down on the rocks below, not a single person came to the office to watch with the postmaster, who went outside from time to time and gazed up into the mist, and then, with a sigh of relief, returned to his armchair before the fireplace in better weather he would have had plenty of gossiping company for avalanche day was quite the liveliest day in his calendar despite the rain which kept pattering on the low roof he hoped that the snow and ice would hold fast to the rock until the sun came again but nevertheless his old ears were constantly on the alert for the crash which he feared on many a january day in the years that were past he had occupied his favourite chair in the warm sun against the east wall of the office surrounded by his neighbours watching the glittering mass and noting the small fragments of ice which broke away from time to time before the final crash he had heard nothing yet and as the gloomy afternoon wore on he began to be almost certain that he was not to lose his holiday after all the postmaster though living so much alone had a way of talking to himself and on this occasion he was more talkative than ever because of the uneasiness he felt it's a quare thing he said getting up and kicking the logs into a blaze and then sitting down again in his sheepskin cushioned chair it's plum quare by way of making these solitary talks more sociable the old man had developed a clever habit of talking in dialogue imagining himself for the time in the company of some congenial spirit for whom he spoke as well as for himself on this particular occasion his imaginary companion was a mountain woman for whom he had felt a sentimental regard years before but to whom he had never told his love what's queer manual why look here lizabeth i've sorted the mail here more'n thirty years watchin avalanches fall off yonder mountain and in all that time i've never set my foot on to the top of it most of us on this side ain't manual and since the bridge rotted away and tumbled into the gorge there ain't no way o gettin thar lizabeth i'm naturally a venturesome man though i never showed it to you lizabeth when i ought to that's what you didn't i'm a venturesome man and this here's what i've made up my mind to lizabeth how i'm determined to see the top of that mountain before i'm a year older and i've set the time lizabeth not in personal in that but meanin that when the dogwood blossoms in the spring i'm going to find some way to get up there how you do it manuel it's likely i'll fall a tree across the gorge don't do it manuel why not the postmaster looked wise and put out his hand as if he were playfully touching his imaginary companion under the chin why not lizabeth because folks do say that the old man that lived up thar was murdered and that his spirit has took the form of a haunt and brings bad luck on such as goes up thar to disturb him the postmaster rose and kicked the fire impatiently bah i'm a bold man lizabeth past occasions notwithstanding i'm sought and determined to do it when the dogwood trees blossom out and i'm lowing you'll come and tend the office lizabeth while i'm gone the postmaster stood with his back to the fire looking down over his left shoulder to where the imaginary form of elizabeth sat 
you'll come and spell me will you elizabeth you always was a accommodatin woman no there ain't nothing for you to-day not so much as a paper don't be in a hurry this here idea of explorin that mounting has took a powerful hold on me sure nothing that you can say will prevent me from so doin well if you must go elizabeth i suppose it's high time i was gettin my supper after i wash the dishes i allow to walk across to the big road and see if there's any tracks good-bye elizabeth good-bye manuel the postmaster was silent while he raked out a bed of coals and set the three-legged iron skillet over the very hottest place then he mixed some indian meal with milk and a pinch of salt and having patted it down in the skillet he put on the cover and filled the rim with more coals and some burning embers after he had buried a potato in the ashes and set the coffee down to warm over he broke out again i couldn't have been mistaken about there being nothing for elizabeth i sort of spoke at random knowing that the last letter she got was in sixty eight month of may then he stepped back so as to look through the letter boxes which were before the south window there's nothing in h except a lynchpin and i allow that ought to be an l no that's for riley hooper hello it's clearin there'll be a moon to-night and nothing's a-goin to drop before to-morrow after he had eaten and put away the supper things the postmaster took down his rifle from the rack over the door and stepped out into the clearing the sky was not yet free from rolling clouds which were drifting into the east across the face of the great full moon that hung directly over the mountain stretching away to the seamed rock where the avalanche hung was a wide old field broken by rocks and bristling with girdled trees whose dead limbs wriggled upward and outward like the hundred hands of briarus the postmaster kept to the foot-worn trail shuffling over the wet leaves and glancing up now and then at the granite front of old whiteside with great satisfaction not only because the avalanche was safe for the night but because he loved to think that whatever secrets the mountain held would be his when the dogwood blossoms came in the spring he went as far as the big road and finding plenty of fresh tracks he kept on in the direction of cashiers until he came to a cabin where the bright warm light glowed through the chinks between the logs and through the cracks about the chimney as if the place were on fire by the merry laughter he heard and the scraping of a violin he knew that a frolic was going on and he chuckled to think that he had in his pocket a certain letter which would be a convenient excuse for dropping in on the revellers the postmaster must have been welcome in his own social person over and above the favour of the letter he brought for it was hard upon twelve o'clock when he came out and took his way homeward feeling jollier than he had felt for many a day and carrying a cake and a paper parcel under his arm for the coming festivities at the office who'd a thought he said turning to look back at the lighted cabin where the revelry was at its height that i'd a been dancin a figure this night on the punch-ins with elizabeth howe it sort o took all the boldness out o me when she come over and asted me i don't low any other woman could a cowed me in that a way i'm a bold man under ordinary conditions prevailin and takin place i ain't easy to skeer he continued as he resumed his walk least way a man is concerned it was cold now and still and the wrinkled mud on the road was curdled with frost the moon was well over to the west range the last cloud had disappeared and the stars were like jewels in the sky through the bare limbs of the trees he was in such a rare state of exhilaration that he was more talkative than ever and kept up a running conversation with first one neighbour and then another until his cheerful dialogue which had brought him to the border of his own field and inside of the office was rudely interrupted by the too hoot of an owl somewhere among the girdled trees yes yeah, shut up said the postmaster carefully laying the cake down on the leaves and cocking his rifle good night riley lynchpins come twelve cents postage stamped on the tag good night manuel i must tend to this sassy critter interruptin of his betters where be you anyway know enough to hold your tongue don't you i'll let you know i'm a bold man leastways and with that he fired his gun at random in the windless night the sharp report seemed to strike against the granite mountain and be thrown back like a ball of sound to go bounding across the cove rolling into the distance 
the postmaster reloaded his gun and eased the lock down upon a fresh cap before he took up the cake muttering at the owl and then chuckling to think that he had silenced his rival he turned out of the trail to a little knoll which commanded a clear view of the granite mountain streaked down with black storm stains that looked like huge banners fluttering out from the shining mass of snow and ice clinging to the crest the postmaster gazed upward for some minutes and then moved on in silence toward the office under the girdled trees the avalanche was uppermost in his mind however and before he had gone far he stopped on another place of vantage to take a last fond look freezin tighter and tighter every blessed minute he began when the dogwood trees blossom in the springtime old rock i'll let you know i'm a bolt he never finished the sentence the cake and the rifle fell to the ground and the postmaster's jaw dropped on its hinges cold chills ran up his back and blew like a wind through his hair while the blood seemed to throb in his ears he was powerless to speak he could only gaze with his bulging eyes at the small figure which rose slowly from the roots of the great icicles and then stood motionless and black against the snow it looked to be a figure so small and far away in the uncertain moonlight and yet it stood where no living man could possibly be his first conviction was that he saw the spirit of the old man of the mountain who for one reason or another was believed to rest uneasily in his grave and when the small object began to thresh the air with its arms like the wings of a windmill he had no further doubt that it was the dreadful aunt of whom elizabeth had warned him with a howl he turned and fled over the field in the direction of the office and as he ran the owl resumed its dismal note doo doo as many times as he fell down he clambered upon his feet again and ran on never daring to look back at the haunt waving its ghostly arms above the roots of the great icicles he thought his time had come for he had heard that men never lived who had once seen the dead and all the time as he ran the mocking cry of the owl resounded through the woods the postmaster was staggering and breathless when he reached his door and once inside he shoved the wooden bolt and leaned against the table in the centre of the room only a few glimmering coals lighted the ashes between the iron fire-dogs just enough moonlight struggled through the grimy south window to show the glazed boxes holding a paper here and an uncalled-for letter there while the unused places were stuffed with bunches of twine and heaps of nails and strings of onions and quite the dustiest litter of odds and ends filled the compartment x y and z as the old man raised his eyes and glared around the shadowy walls there was something which caught a fleck of moonlight high up on the chimney but that was only the perforated cross of the churn dasher thrust between the logs in the north window over opposite to the letter boxes his eyes fell on a wide-mouthed bottle from whose top two dead stalks of geraniums drooped over the shoulders of the bottle and then spread out to right and left against the glass with a shiver of fear he supported himself over to his armchair and sank down with his back to the object which reminded him of the haunt flinging its arms against the snow on the mountains the postmaster had not yet found his voice perhaps he feared to break the death-like stillness of the room heavy with the sooty odour of the fireplace for some moments he heard nothing but his own heavy breathing and then a dull clatter like some hard object striking on wood came from behind the house instead of being startled at hearing this noise the postmaster got upon his feet and shuffled across the floor and out through a creaking door into a lean-to where the moonlight poured through the loose log wall and lay in spots and stripes on the old brindled plough-steer which was still grinding his crumpled horns against the wooden rack above his manger i've seen it buck i've seen it the haunt the haunt the postmaster's voice had come at last and as he spoke he leaned on the shoulder of the ox whose cold wet nose sought his groping hand i hain't got long to stay i've seen what tain't good to see and live i hope you'll get a good master when i'm gone buck tell elizabeth that i died a blessing of her name with all the boldness took clean out of me 
cut off in my sins he moaned throwing his arms about the neck of the ox for seeing a heart unbeknownst and hit striking out desperate at josiah or whoever did the murder and not care him for the avalanche no more than you care for a hickory gad whoa buck whoa and as he spoke he patted the animal on the neck i'm a goin to stay long o you buck this whole endurin night i'm a feared to go back into the office the postmaster trembled where he stood and a ray of moonlight coming through a knot hole in the slab roof fell full on his ashen face and glaring eyes he spoke no more for a time except an occasional caressing word to soothe the uneasy ox which sidled about and grated his horns against the wooden stanchions then when he grew weary in that position he climbed over into the long manger and crouched down on the corn shucks where he could see the mild eyes of the ox and the spots and stripes of moonlight on his tough hide gradually he grew calmer and tried to put the gruesome sight he had seen out of his mind i never know before you was such good company buck you have got eyes like a woman and a heap more patience i'll never strike you another blow and if i live to see to-morrow i'll write you a letter and put it in a bee box expressing my brotherly feelings and language more fitter than i'm able to do now the postmaster continued to mutter caressingly to his dumb companion until the bars and spots of moonlight began to fade leaving the ox in obscurity which was the time when philip reached the upper bank and sank down on the snow after hearing the telescope strike on the rocks in the cove and both men must have fallen asleep at about the same time it was mid forenoon when the postmaster awoke and a man was standing over him shaking his shoulder the man was coming home from the frolic at the cabin and finding the front door bolted had come around to the shed he had the cake and the gun which he had found in the field what in the name of sense are you doing here at this time of day manuel come out in that manger the postmaster obeyed in a dazed sort of way and when he was on his feet he shook the straws and bits of corn husks from his clothing the old brindle ox looking at the two men with his mild eyes from his place in the corner why well, made you drap these things out in the field manuel said the man come into the office jonas said the postmaster leading the way and then he told the other of the fearful sight he had seen the sun was warm after the rain and soon others began to come men and women and he told his story again and again to the awe and amazement of his simple listeners i seen a quare streak down the long bank as i came through the woods said one man i sure did and then they all went out into the field where the gun and the cake had been found sure enough there was a dull line plainly to be seen on the smooth crust of the snow they all agreed that this was the track of the aunt who had amused himself in the night-time by climbing up and sliding down on the face of the avalanche the story spread through the settlements and no man was bold enough thereafter to think of bridging the gorge to get upon the haunted mountain chapter eighteen knowledge from above when philip awoke after having swooned at the feet of his comrades when his rescue was accomplished he lay in the delicious warmth of his bunk the late afternoon sun streamed in at the window over his head and coleman sat watching at his side bromley was stirring the fire which was burning briskly on the hearth and the smell of gruel was in the room the station flags and the crossed sabres brightened the space above the chimney-piece the map hung on the opposite wall and over it the old flag with thirty-five stars seemed to have been draped just where it would first catch his waking eye strangely enough the immediate cause that awoke philip was a dull boom which made the faces of his comrades turn pale and which was no less than the fall of the avalanche on which he had passed the night and the best part of the day before philip if he heard the sound at all was not sufficiently awake at the time to understand its awful meaning and without noticing the pallor of his comrades he weakly put out his hand which coleman took in his own with a warm pressure and bromley came over to the side of the bunk and looked doubtingly into his face neither of his comrades uttered a word give me the gruel said philip i was never so hungry before and don't look at me so george i'm not mad 
after he had eaten he talked so rationally that coleman and bromley shook each other's hands and laughed immoderately at every slightest excuse for merriment but said not a word of the delusion which had so lately darkened philip's mind they were so very jolly that philip laughed weakly himself by infection and then he asked them to tell him how he had fallen over the mountain without knowing it in reply to this question coleman told him that he had been sick and that he must have walked off the great rock in the thick fog philip was silent for a space as if trying to digest this strange information and then with some animation he said look here fred the funniest part of this whole dark business was when i had climbed up to the top of the great bank there alongside a hole in the snow lay our telescope when i put out my hand to take it it rolled away through the opening in the snow and the lord forgive me fellows i heard it ring on the rocks at the bottom of the cove with this long speech and without waiting for a reply philip fell off into a gentle doze coleman and bromley having no doubt now that philip's mind was restored because he seemed to have no recollection of the princess or of his strange behaviour on the mountain for the year that was past were very happy at this change in his condition as to the telescope they regarded its fall as a very dangerous matter and a catastrophe which might bring them some unwelcome visitors but then it was possible that it had fallen among inaccessible rocks and would never be found at all if any one should come to disturb them they might hear of some unpleasant facts of which they would rather remain in ignorance now that nearly five years had passed since the great war they thought that whoever came would not exult over them in an unbearable way or rub insults into their wounds they knew that some of the mountaineers had been union men and although they would never seek communication with them a connection formed against their will might result to their advantage they had a good supply of the double eagles left somebody held title to the mountain they knew and if the telescope did bring them visitors they would buy the plateau from the deep gorge up and pay in gold for it handsomely too then they could send down their measures to a tailor and have new uniforms made to the buttons they had saved that is if the tailor was not a secessionist too hot-headed to soil his hands with the uniform of the old mutilated and disgraced union then too they could buy seeds and books and a great many comforts to make their lives more enjoyable on the mountain and so it came about that when month after month passed and nobody came the three soldiers were rather disappointed they resolved to save what remained of their minted and milled coins against any unforeseen chance they might have to put them in circulation and now that they thought of it it would have been much wiser to have melted the coins of the united states and saved the english guineas if however the world had not changed greatly since they left it they believed the natives in the valley below would accept good red gold if the face of the old boy himself was stamped on the coin when philip was quite himself again by reason of his knowledge of milling he took entire control of the golden mill in the cold weather his old overcoat was dusty with meal as a miller's should be and in the summer days plenty of the yellow dust clung to the hairs on his arms and in his thin red beard it is a sunday morning in september again and to be exact with the date for it was a very important one in their history it is the fifth day of the month in the year seventy the three soldiers are standing together by the door of the mill dressed very much as we last saw them there and engaged in an animated conversation an egg said lieutenant coleman facing his two comrades and crossing his hands unconsciously over the great a on the back of his canvas trousers as an article of food may be considered as the connecting link between the animal and the vegetable if we had to kill the hen to get the egg i should consider it a sin to eat it what we have to do and that right briskly is to eat the eggs to prevent the hens from increasing until they are numerous enough to devour every green thing on the mountain well, i'm not so sure of that said philip toying with his one dusty suspender we could feed the eggs to the bear 
we could but we won't said bromley shaking some crumbs from the front of his gown when nature prompts a hen to cackle do you think we are expected to look the other way why philip you will be going back on honey next because bees make it we are vegetarians because we no longer think it right to destroy animal life we not only think it wrong to destroy but we believe it to be our duty to preserve it wherever we find it don't we spread corn on the snow in the winter for the coons and squirrels come now we are not vegetarians at all we are simply unwilling to take life which leaves us to choose between vegetable diet and starvation now then said bromley spreading out his bare arms and shrugging his shoulders of the two i choose a vegetable diet but if i could eat half a broiled chicken without injury to the bird i'd do it that's the sort of vegetarian i am oh, nonsense said philip you're a dabster at splitting hairs you are it was uphill work making a vegetarian of you george but we have got you there at last and you can't squirm out of it give it to him phil cried coleman hit him on the salt exactly continued philip taking a swallow of water from a golden cup and addressing himself to bromley when the salt was gone you thought you'd never enjoy another meal didn't you and how is it now you are honest enough to admit that you never knew what a keen razor-edged taste was before i'll bet you a quart of double eagles george that you get more flavour out of a dish of common at that moment a bag of sand came through the branches of the tree which shaded the three soldiers as they talked there was a dark shadow moving over the sunlit ground and a rushing sound in the air above their own conversation and the noise of the water pouring from the trough over the idle wheel and splashing on the stones must have prevented their hearing human voices close at hand rushing out from under the trees they saw a huge balloon sweeping over their heads the enormous bag of silk swaying and pulsating in the meshes of the netting was a hundred feet above the plateau but the willow basket in which two men and one woman were seated was not more than half that distance from the ground the surprise the whistling of the monster through the air the snapping and rending of the drag rope with its iron hook which was tearing up the turf and which in an instant more scattered the shingles on the roof of their house like chaff and carried off some of their bedding which was airing there all these things were so startling and came upon them so suddenly that they had but short opportunity to observe the human beings who came so near them brief as the time was the faces of the three strangers were indelibly impressed upon their memory and no portion of their dress seen above the rim of the basket escaped their observation the woman who appeared to be perfectly calm and self-possessed kissed her hand with a smile so enchanting lighting a face which seemed to the soldiers to be a face of some angelic beauty that they half doubted if she could really belong to the race of earthly women they had once known so intimately the men were not in like manner attractive to their eyes but seemed to be of that oily-haired waxy-moustached beringed and professorish variety which suggested to them chiropodists or small theatrical managers notwithstanding the rushing and creaking of the cordage the voices of the men in the balloon had that peculiar quality of distinctness that sound has on a lowery morning before a storm indeed each voice above them had a vibration of its own which enabled the soldiers to hear all commingled and yet to hear each separately and distinctly the hurried orders for the management of the balloon were given in subdued tones and uttered with less excitement than might have been expected in the circumstances yet the words came to the earth with startling distinctness when they saw the soldiers the taller of the men who wore the larger diamond in his shirt front put his hand to his mouth and cried in deafening tones skylark from charleston three thirty yesterday at the same time the beautiful lady laying her hand on her breast as if to indicate herself uttered the words new york new york even while they spoke their voices grew softer as the balloon sped on the great gas bag inclined forward by the action of the drag rope and its shadow flying beneath it over the surface of the plateau 
as soon as the two professors saw the danger which threatened the log-house they began to throw out sandbags from the car and the lady clung with both hands to the guy ropes it was too late however to prevent the contact and the lurch given to the basket by the momentary hold which the grappling hook took in the roof of the house threw several objects to the ground and on its release the balloon rose higher in the air having a u s blanket streaming back from the end of the drag rope the property they were bearing away was seen by the men in the car and the rope was taken in with all speed but a fresh breeze having set in from the east the balloon was swept rapidly along so that it was well beyond the plateau when the blanket fluttered loose from the hook the soldiers ran after it with outstretched arms until they came to the edge of the great boulder where they saw their good woolen blanket again still drifting downward with funny antics through the air until it fell noiselessly at the very door of the cove postmaster the balloon itself was by this time soaring above the mountains beyond the cove and they kept their eyes on the receding ball until it was only a speck among the clouds and then vanished altogether into the pale blue of the horizon the soldiers had not seen the objects tumble out of the car when the drag rope caught in the shingles of their house and the thoughts of their wretched roof and lost blanket had the power for the moment to displace even the image of the beautiful lady whom they could never never forget the passage of the balloon had at first dazed and awed and then charmed and bewildered them leaving them in a state of trembling excitement impossible for the reader to conceive of they no longer had the telescope with which to observe the surprise of the cove postmaster when he found the grey blanket with u s in the centre but they had the presence of mind to get behind trees where they waited until he came out he looked very small in the distance when he came at last but they could see that the object was a man it was evident from his not having been out before that he had not seen the balloon pass over he seemed to stoop down and raise the blanket and then to drop it and stand erect and by a tiny flash of light which each of the soldiers saw and knew must be the reflection of the sun on his spectacles they were sure he was looking at the top of the mountain and thinking of the east wind there was no help for it and when he disappeared into the office with their blanket they chinked the gold in their pockets for they carried coin with them now and thought that an opportunity might soon come for them to spend it as they moved away in the direction of the house they were sorry that the drag rope of the balloon had not fastened its hook in the plateau for they believed they were rich enough to buy the coats off the backs of the two men and the diamonds in their shirt fronts if they had cared for them as the three soldiers neared the house they began picking up the sandbags stenciled skylark eighteen seventy philip who was in the advance had secured three which he suddenly threw down into the grass with a cry of joy for at their feet lay a book with an embellished green cover the three were almost as much excited as they had been when they discovered the contents of the keg which they had dug out of the grave of the old man of the mountain and instantly had their heads together believing that they were about to learn something of the condition of the old united states and even fearing they might read that they no longer existed at all they were so nervous that they fumbled at the covers and hindered one another and between them in their haste they dropped it on the ground when they had secured it again and got their six eyes on the title page imagine their surprise and disgust when they read a treatise on deep-sea fishing bother deep-sea fishing exclaimed philip hum said coleman it will work up into paper for the diary bromley said nothing but looked more disgusted than either of his comrades and gave the book which they had dropped again a kick with his foot their disappointment was somewhat relieved presently for in the chips by the door of the house they found a small handbag of alligator leather marked with three silver letters e q r the key was attached to the lock by a ribbon and as soon as the bag could be opened coleman seized upon another small book which was called the luck of roaring camp the author was one francis brett hart of whom they had never heard before 
the book was a new one for it bore 1870 on the title page and the leaves were uncut except at a particular story entitled miggles besides this book the bag contained numerous little trinkets among which the most useful article was a pair of scissors they found three dainty linen handkerchiefs with monograms a cut glass vinaigrette containing salts of ammonia a rag of chamois skin dusty with white powder a toothbrush and a box of the tooth powder aforesaid a brush and a comb a box of bonbons a pair of tan-coloured gloves a button-hook and an opened letter addressed to elizabeth q rose number one sixty five west one thirtieth street new york city the letter bore the postmark liverpool august twelve and was stamped at the new york office august twenty eight p m here was evidence of progress eight days from liverpool to new york the envelope had been torn off at the lower right-hand corner in opening so that it was impossible to tell whether the letters u s or c s had been written below new york the soldiers cut the leaves of the book and glanced hurriedly over the pages without finding anything to clear up the mystery which interested them most they sat down on the woodpile sorely disappointed to talk over the events of the morning and presently they began clipping off their long beards with the scissors and using the brush and comb to which their heads had so long been strangers the experience was all so strange that but for the treasures left behind not counting the treatise on deep-sea fishing they might have doubted the reality of the passage of their aerial visitor when it came to a division of the trifles of a lady's toilette the well-known prejudice of the world below concerning a second-hand toothbrush was cast to the winds by bromley while lieutenant coleman who had some qualms of conscience was better satisfied with the rag of chamois skin for the same purpose the vinaigrette and the gloves fell to philip they had just a handkerchief apiece and nobody cared for the button-hook the letter found in the bag was a subject of heated discussion and from motives of chivalrous delicacy remained for a long time unread george bromley contended that its contents might throw some light on the subject which the books had left in obscurity while lieutenant coleman shrank from offering such an indignity to the memory of the angelic lady of the air it was finally agreed that bromley might examine and then destroy it lieutenant coleman declining to be made acquainted with his contents they never quite understood the association of the beautiful lady with the two men of whom they had but a poor opinion when bromley suggested that to their starved eyes a cook might seem a princess his comrades were sufficiently indignant and reminded him of her literary taste as shown by the quality of the new book found in the bag after all they had learned nothing of the great secret that vexed their lives was there still in existence a starry flag bearing any semblance to this one which was now floating over the mountain was it still loved in the land and respected on the sea to men who had seen it bent forward under the eagles of the old republic gray in the stifling powder clouds falling and rising in the storm of battle a pale ghost of a flag fluttering colorless on the plain or climbing the stubborn mountains human lives falling like leaves for its upholding this was the burning question End of chapter eighteen chapters nineteen and twenty of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the cave of the bats when the nine small gunny sacks stenciled skylark eighteen seventy were emptied on the floor of the house the crustacea of the atlantic sands had found a resting place on the summit of whiteside mountain and might yet furnish evidence to some grave scientist of the future to prove beyond a doubt that the sea at no very remote period had surged above the peaks of the blue ridge starfish shells and bones and fragments of the legs of spider crabs horseshoe crabs and crayfish and some very active sand fleas 
afforded much scientific amusement to our exiles and brought vividly to mind the boom of the sea and the white bait and whales that wiggle waggle in its depth neither the telescope nor the army blanket with u s in the centre nor the two combined had brought any visitor to the three soldiers nor any information of the real estate of affairs in the united states which would quickly have terminated their exile the very pathetic and amusing volume of stories found in the alligator's skin bag caused more tears and healthy laughter than the soldiers had given away to since their great disappointment and actually brought about such neglect of the october work on the plantation that more than half the potato crop rotted in the ground on the twenty first of that month in this very balloon year the area of sherman territory was extended by the addition of half an acre of rocks and brambles on the boulder side of the mountain and afterward of much more as will be shown in due time the twenty-first day of october in the year seventy then was a lowry day a strong humid wind was blowing steadily across the mountain and soughing in the boughs of the pines while the low clouds westward bound flew in ragged rifts overhead it was a pleasant wind to feel and the rising and falling cadence of its song reminded the soldiers of a wind from the sea in the successive seasons they had gleaned the grove so thoroughly even cutting the dry limbs from the trees that they were now obliged to search under the carpet of needles for the fat pine knots which formerly lay in abundance on the surface at the extreme southern end of the tongue of land on which the pines grew a solitary stump clung in the base of the cliff the outer fiber of the wood had crumbled away leaving the resinous heart and the tough roots firmly bedded in the soil they had been chopping and digging for an hour before they loosened and removed the central mass continuing their quest for one of the great roots which ran into the earth under the cliff george dealt a vigorous stroke on the rotten stone and earth beneath which yielded so unexpectedly that he lost his footing and at the same time his hold on the axe which promptly disappeared into the bowels of the earth they heard it ring upon the rocks below with strange echoes as if it had fallen into a subterranean cavern at the same time the wind rushed through the opening in a current warmer than the surrounding atmosphere and brought with it a strong offensive smell as if they had entered a menagerie in august as soon as the soldiers recovered from their surprise they set vigorously to work for the recovery of the axe attacking the loose earth with their gold-tipped shovel and with the tough oaken handspike with which they had been prying at the stump their efforts rapidly enlarged the opening and presently the great root itself tumbled in after the axe philip ran to the house for a light and by the time he returned with a blazing torch coleman and bromley had enlarged the opening under the cliff until it was wide enough to admit their bodies easily all was darkness even blackness within and the rank animal smell was as offensive as ever so that philip held his nose in disgust by passing the torch into the opening of the cavern they could see the axe lying on the earthen floor ten feet below and to the right the overlapping strata of granite seemed to offer a rude stairway for their descent george entered at once with the torch in one hand and in the other the handspike with which to test his footing in advance in another moment he stood on the hard floor by the axe and the light of his torch revealed the rocky sides of the cavern stretching away to the south along the side of the mountain coleman provided himself with one of the fattest of the pine knots and descended into the cavern after bromley with some hesitation philip followed the resinous smoke of the torches relieved the subterraneous atmosphere somewhat of its offensive animal odor and the flames flooded the walls and ceiling with light their voices calling to each other as they advanced sounded abnormally loud and seemed to fill the space about them with a cavernous ring in which they detected no side echoes which would indicate lateral chambers branching off from the main passage by the current of air flaring the torches back toward the opening they had made they knew that the passage itself must be open to the day at its other end 
the roof seemed to be about eight feet above their heads although at times it drew nearer and occasionally it retired to a greater altitude but never beyond the searching illumination of their torches presently as they advanced their attention was drawn to brown masses of something like fungi clinging to the rock overhead but partaking so closely of the colour and texture of the stone that they seemed after all to be but flinty lumps on the roof as bromley who was in front came to a point where the ceiling hung so low as to be within reach he swept the flame of his torch across one of these brown patches and straight away the stifling air was filled with a squeaking unearthly chorus and with the beating of innumerable wings scorched by the flame and blinded by the light many of these disabled creatures which proved to be a colony of bats fluttered to the floor and dashed against the bare feet of the soldiers with a clammy touch that made the cold chills rise in their hair this was too much for philip who turned back to join tumbler in the open air at the mouth of the cavern at the same time however the offensive odour was accounted for and bromley and coleman had no further fear of meeting larger animals as they advanced as a lover of animals george was shocked at the cruel consequences of his rash action as a bold explorer however he pushed on into the gruesome darkness at a pace that soon left coleman's prudent feet far behind the latter had a wholesome fear of treading on some yielding crust which might precipitate him to other and more terrible depths the way seemed to turn somewhat as they advanced for at times the light of george's torch vanished behind the projection of one or the other wall and at such times coleman called eagerly to him to wait bromley's cheery voice evidently advancing came ringing back so distinctly that his companion was reassured by his seeming nearness once when the darkness had continued for a long time in front coleman began to be alarmed at the thought that bromley's torch must have gone out and then the fear that he might have fallen into some fissure in the rocks made him cold about the heart lieutenant coleman was now picking his way more gingerly than ever and holding his light high above his head when to add to his terror he thought he heard something approaching behind him sure enough when he turned about in the darkness of the cavern just beyond the illumination of his torch he saw two gleaming eyes the eyes were fixed upon him and the head of the animal moved from side to side but came no nearer he would have given worlds for the carbine his blood ran cold in his veins at the thought of his terrible situation he was utterly helpless hemmed in by the rocks it was impossible to go back he could only go forward he remembered then that the fiercest of wild animals even lions and tigers kept back in the darkness and glared all night with their hungry eyes at the fires of hunters he was safe then to go on but a dreadful conflict was in store for the two men if the animal should follow them out of the cavern bromley's torch now appeared in the distance coleman was too terrified to call but instead moved on in silence occasionally flaring his torch behind him and always seeing the gleaming eyes when he looked back try as he would he could get no farther from them there were occasional stumbling blocks in the way and once or twice he encountered rocks which he was obliged to pass around whenever coleman turned and waved the torch the animal whined as if he too were in fear terrified as lieutenant coleman was he could not help noticing that the brown colonies of bats now appeared more frequently on the stone ceiling and presently the air grew perceptibly fresher as he advanced he began to realize the presence of a gray light apart from that of his torch and finally coming sharply around a projecting rock he saw the welcome light of day streaming in through a wide opening in the rocks and at one side thrusting into a crevice george's torch was flaring and smoking in the wind 
coleman placed his torch with the other hoping that the lights would continue to protect them from the animal and then he sprang out of the cavern into the sweet open air with that joyous feeling of relief which can be understood only by one who has passed through a similar experience george was standing in the dry grass with a great stone in each hand as if he already knew their danger and was prepared but when coleman told him in hurried words what they had to expect he dropped the stones and they began to look about for a place of safety it was not far to a high rock upon which they both scrambled and then bromley let himself down again and passed up a number of angular stones for ammunition whatever the mysterious beast might be they could keep him off from the rock for a time but they were not prepared for a siege they had little to say to each other and that in whispers as they strained their eyes to look into the entrance to the cavern bromley however was softly humming a tune and just as coleman looked up at him in astonishment he dropped the stones from his hands and burst into laughter and sure enough there in the mouth of the cavern stood their tame bear tumbler wagging his head from side to side just as coleman had seen the mysterious eyes move in the darkness and moreover he was still licking his chops after the feast he had made on the bats lieutenant coleman had been so alarmed at first and then so gratified at the happy outcome of his adventure that he had not noticed the character of the stones which bromley had been handling it was not until his attention was called to a flake of mica that he looked about him on the ground to see everywhere blocks and flakes of what is commonly called isinglass they could have something better than wooden shutters for their windows now by a certain gnarled chestnut which overhung the cliff above them growing out of the hill near the spring they estimated the length of the subterraneous passage to be not less than a quarter of a mile the sun which had broken through the clouds indicated by the angle of his rays that the afternoon was well past they now thought it advisable to retrace their steps through the unsavory cavern in view of the stifling passage coleman inhaled deep draughts of the sweet outer air and shuddered involuntarily at the necessity of repeating the experience even when he knew the animal now following him was only stupid old tumbler george handed him a piece of the mica to carry and his careless happy mood indicated that he returned to the subterraneous passage as gaily as if it were a pleasant walk overland as they drew near the entrance to the cavern with the bear shambling at their heels an indefinable dread of trouble ahead took possession of coleman it might have been the absence of the resinous smell of the torches at all events they were presently standing in the gruesome half-light before the empty crevice through which they could see their pine knots still burning fifty feet below in an inner cavern as their torches had burned to the edge of the rock they had fallen through the opening they were without fire and if they should succeed in striking it with their flints they had no means of carrying it a hundred yards into the darkness the situation was frightful outside the perpendicular cliff rose a matter of sixty feet to the overhanging trees of the plateau and close to the south ledge which towered above it the two men and the bear were prisoners on this barren shelf of rocks with a quarter of a mile of subterraneous darkness separating them from food and shelter from life itself was it their destiny coleman thought to die of starvation among these inhospitable rocks hung like a speck between the plateau and the valley watched by the circling eagles and by the patient buzzards who would perch on the nearer tree-tops to await their dissolution the very thought of the situation unmanned him lieutenant coleman was not a man to shrink from enemies whom he could see but the darkness and the dangers of the half-explored cavern terrified him corporal bromley on the other hand was only made angry by the loss of the torches and the livid expression of his face reminded his comrade of the morning when they had received the news of general sherman's death before the works at atlanta in a moment however he was calm 
without a word he walked away among the rocks and when he came back he held in his hands a lithe pole ten or twelve feet long not a very interesting outlook fred for a man who would rather be eating his supper said george trying the strength of his pole but you must be patient and amuse yourself as best you can lieutenant coleman stared at bromley in speechless amazement as he disappeared into the cavern carrying the pole across his breast it was something less than courage it was the utter absence of the instinct of fear which the others had so often noticed in his character would he succeed the better for the very want of this quality with which the all-wise has armed animal life for its protection perhaps the bear was snuffling about coleman as if he were trying to understand why he remained and when he failed to attract his attention he turned about and shambled after bromley although coleman was deeply concerned by the dangers which threatened his comrade he reasoned with certainty that wherever bromley was he was as calm as an oyster regarding his progress as only a question of time and some bruises to keep his mind away from the cavern he rose mechanically and began to gather up the fragments of mica and heap them together for an hour he threaded his way among the rocks thus employed the glittering heap grew larger for the supply was quite inexhaustible and he discovered fresh deposits on every hand it was now grown dark and he made his way to the mouth of the cavern vainly hoping to see a star advancing in the darkness but only to meet a flight of bats wheeling out into the night carefully he crept back and seated himself on a smooth stone by the side of his store of mica and imagined himself a hunter in the middle of a trackless desert dying for a drop of water beside a princely fortune in accumulated elephant's dust when he looked up the dark mass of the tree-crowned cliff cut softly against a lighter gloom but when he turned his eyes away from the mountain the sky or the clouds or whatever it might be seemed to surround him and press upon him oh for one star in the distance to lift the sky from his head or better yet the calm face of the moon and the touch of its yellow light on tree and stone instead of anything so cheerful a patter of raindrops met his upturned face as if in mockery of his wish and then the rain increased to a steady downpour beating from the east and he knew the autumnal equinox was upon them he reflected that george might never feel the rain miserable thought what if he were to perish in the darkness separated from him and from philip after having lived so long together coleman might have sought shelter in the mouth of the cavern but he was indifferent to the rain falling on his bare back and canvas trousers how long he had been waiting two hours or three he had no means of telling his watch had long since ceased to run up on the plateau they had noon marks at the house and at the mill and at night when it was clear they went out and looked at the seven stars he was thoroughly drenched by the rain which had now been falling for a long time certainly george would have returned before this if all had gone well with him and then his mind returned to the contemplation of that other possibility with a perverseness over which he could exercise no control he saw bromley lost in some undiscovered byway of the subterraneous passage groping his way hopelessly into the centre of the mountain knowing that he was lost when go which way he would his pole no longer reached the walls he saw him retracing his steps now going this way now that but always going he knew not whither too brave to yield to despair then he saw him in a lower cavern where he had fallen through the floor groping about the rough walls with bleeding hands and staring eyes patiently searching for a foothold his indomitable pluck never failing him horrible as these fancies were others more dreadful oppressed his half wakeful mind for he was so tired that in spite of the rain he lapsed into a state of unconsciousness in which he dreamed that the roof of that suffocating cavern covered with the brown blotches of bats was settling slowly upon george until he could no longer walk erect lower lower it came in its fearful descent until it bumped his head as he crawled 
now the roof grazes his back as he writhes on his belly like a snake fred old oh boy fred and there stood bromley in the flesh as calm as if nothing unusual had happened the raindrops hissing in the flame of his torch chapter twenty the stained glass windows and the prismatic fowls owing to the difficulties of the passage through the cave of the bats and the utter barrenness of the rocky half-acre which lay at its other end the three soldiers never entered it again during the fall and winter which followed its discovery the two blocks of isinglass which they had brought away on their first visit were ample for their purpose and as soon as they had secured their supply of fat pine knots for light in the long winter evenings they set about constructing two windows to take the place of the sliding boards which closed those openings in the cold snowy days it is true they could not look out through the new windows but much light could enter where all had been darkness before time was nothing to the soldiers in these late autumn days and indeed the more of it they could spend on any work they undertook the more such work contributed to their contentment and happiness they wished to have their windows ornamental as well as useful and it was philip's suggestion that they should try an imitation of stained glass they had some of the carbine cartridges left and as they no longer killed any creatures the bullets would supply them with lead to unite the small pieces of isinglass and outline their designs one of the mica blocks chanced to be of pale green colour and they made many experiments to produce reds and blues oxide of iron or the common red iron rust gave a rich carmine powder which mixed with the white of an egg adhered to the inner side of the small panes they found a few dried huckleberries from which they extracted a strong blue by boiling they could procure yellow only by beating a small bit of gold to the thinnest leaf which they pasted upon the flake of mica the reds and blues as they applied them were only water colors but the inner side of the glass was not exposed to the rain after the one square window which looked toward the cove and consequently let in the afternoon sun was finished in a fantastic arrangement of the three rich colors bordered by pale green it was decided with great enthusiasm to reproduce in the opposite window their dear old flag with its thirty-five stars to do this they cut away the logs on one side until they had doubled the area of the opening they managed to stiffen the frame on the inner side with strips of dogwood which made a single cross against the light leaving the blue field of stars unobstructed it was a great comfort to their patriotic hearts to see the sun glowing on their united states window when they awoke in the morning or to see the ruddy firelight dancing on the old flag if one of them came in from the mill or the branch in the evening in fact when this work was finished the three soldiers wrapped in their faded blue overcoats were never tired of walking about outside their house in the chilly november evenings to admire their first artwork illuminated by the torchlight within their tough bare feet insensible to the sharp stones and the grey hoar-frost wore away the withered grass opposite to each of their stained-glass windows but the patch of trodden earth outside the window which showed the glowing stripes and gleaming stars of the old flag was much the larger otherwise their prospects for the winter were by no means as brilliant as their windows for besides the failure in the potato crop the white grubs had made sad havoc with their corn in two successive plantings and the yield in october had been alarmingly light even the chestnuts had been subject to a blight and altogether it was what the farmers would call a bad year the fowls had increased to an alarming extent considering the necessity of feeding so many and as winter approached their eggs were fewer than ever the case was not so bad that it would be necessary to shorten their rations as they had done before the harvest of the first year but with so many mouths to feed there was danger that they would find themselves without seed for the next planting 
then too there was a very grave danger that before spring these stubborn vegetarians would be forced to resort to broiled chicken spiced with gunpowder which was nearly as repulsive to their minds as leaving the mountain and going down into the triumphant confederacy the bear at least would require no feeding and with the very first snow old tumbler disappeared as usual making the soldiers rather wish that for this particular winter hibernation could be practised by human animals as well as by bears after christmas the weather became unusually cold and the winds swept with terrific force across the top of the mountain the snow was so deep that the path they dug to the mill was banked above their heads as they walked in it and the mill itself showed only its half roof of shingles and its long water trough above the surface of the snow from the trough huge icicles were pendant and it was ornamented with great curves of snow and when philip set the wheels in motion a gray dust rose above the bank and the whir of the grinding as heard in the house was subdued and muffled like the very ghost of a sound the soldiers dug open spaces to give light outside the stained-glass windows and through these the evening firelight repeated the gorgeous colors on the snow from the path to the mill they dug a branch to the forge and tunneled a passage to the water from which they broke the ice every day short as was their supply of corn they were obliged to feed it to the fowls with a lavish hand as long as the deep snow remained this necessity kept them busy shelling the ears by the fire in the warm house after they had brought them in from the mill or the forge and half a gunny sack of corn was thrown out on the snow at the morning and evening feeding since the hut of the old man of the mountain had been made into a forge the fowls had roosted in the branches of the old chestnuts and had got on very well even in the winters that were past with full crops they seemed to be thriving equally well during the severe cold which attended the period of deep snow the fifteenth of january in the new year which was eighteen seventy one was the first of a four days thaw the sun beamed with unusual heat on the mountain and under his rays the snow rapidly disappeared and the ground came to light again with its store of dry seeds the three-pronged tracks of the fowls were printed everywhere in the soft topsoil where they scampered about in pursuit of grubs and worms on the fourth day the avalanche fell from the great boulder into the cove with the usual midwinter crashes and reverberations which reminded philip of his narrow escape the winter before on the evening of this fourth day the thaw was followed by a light rain which froze as it fell and developed into a regular ice storm during the night when the three soldiers looked out on the morning of the nineteenth they found their house coated with ice and the mountain top a scene of glittering enchantment every tree and bush was coated with a transparent armor of glass the lithe limbs of the birches and young chestnuts were bent downward in graceful curves by the weight of the ice which under the rays of the rising sun guttered and scintillated with all the colors of the rainbow every rock and stone had its separate casing and every weed and blade of grass was stiffened with a tiny shining overcoat the stalks on the plantation stood up like a glittering field of pikes despite the difficulty of walking over the uneven ground and the slippery rocks they made their way not without occasional falls to the western side of the plateau to observe the effect in the cove philip was in raptures over the prismatic variety of colors picking out and naming the tints with a childish glee and with a subtle appreciation of color that far outran the limited vision of his comrades and made them think that sherman territory had possibly defrauded the world below of a first-class painter as they turned back toward the house after their first outburst of enthusiasm over the beauties of the ice storm bromley remarked that it was strange they had not been awakened as usual by the crowing of the cocks indeed the stillness of the hour was remarkable 
it was strange that while they had lain in their bunks after daybreak they had not heard the cocks answering one another from one end of the plateau to the other usually they heard first the clear ringing note of some knowing old bird burst loud and shrill from under the very window and then the pert reply of some upstart youngster who had not yet learned to manage his crow drifting faintly back from the rocks to the west then straightway all the crowers of all ages and of every condition of shrillness and hoarseness tried for five mortal minutes to crow one another down and when one weak far-away chicken seemed to have got the last word another would break the stillness and the strident contest would begin again perhaps they had heard all this and not noticed it they were so used to the noise it was like the ticking of a clock or the measured pounding of the slow john but it was certain that nothing of the kind was going on at present in leaving the house they had been so enchanted by the hues of the ice storm that they now remembered they had not so much as turned their eyes in the direction of the roost when they came upon the brow of the hill which overlooked the mill which was a silver mill now the limbs of the trees which stretched along the bank beyond were crowded with the fowls at least four hundred of them sitting still on their perches philip who fell down in his eagerness and rolled over on the ice remarked as he got upon his feet that it was too knowing a flock of birds to leave the sure hold it had on the limbs to come down on to the slippery ground as the soldiers came nearer however they noticed that their fowls in the sunlight were quite the most brilliantly prismatic objects they had seen for their red combs and parti-coloured feathers made a rich showing through the transparent coating of ice which enveloped them like shells and held them fast to the limbs where they sat whether they had been frozen stiff or smothered by the icy envelope they were unable to determine but they could see that all the fowls had met with a very beautiful death except two or three of the toughest old roosters who had managed to crack the icy winding sheet about their bills one of these who had more life in him than the others made a dismal attempt to crow bromley hastened to get the ladder from the mill and the hatchet and wherever a living bird was to be seen he put up the ladder regardless of the dead ones which broke off and fell down and chipping the ice around its claws removed it tenderly to the ground in the end the three soldiers carried just two apiece one under each arm of these tough old veterans into the house and not daring to bring them near the fire set them up to thaw gradually against the inner side of the door then they made a pot of hasty pudding for their own breakfast but before they touched it themselves they fed a little of it steaming hot to each reviving old bird in fact the poor fowls looked so much like coloured glass images when tilted against the door that fearing at any moment they might topple over and break into fragments they laid each rooster carefully on his side where the ice melted by degrees into sloppy pools on the floor the oldest of these unhappy survivors had come up the mountain tied to a pack saddle and consequently was more than six years old he was big of frame and tawny of colour and had long sharp spurs curved like small powder horns and his crow when he was in good health proclaimed him the leader of the flock the other five cocks although but a trifle younger belonged to the next generation for they came of the first summer's hatching their plumage was red and black and their long sweeping tail feathers cased in ice would certainly have been snapped off if they had had the least power to move their bodies as the ice melted from their heads they looked about the house with their round red eyes and otherwise lay quite helpless on their sides their claws drawn up to their crops and curved as they had been taken from the limbs the soldiers looked on full of sympathy and fed their patients now and then with a small portion of warm pudding and finally remembering their medicine chest which they had never yet had occasion to use they waited patiently until the ice melted so that they could handle the fowls without danger of breaking and then they held each rooster up by the neck and dosed him with a spoonful of whiskey and quinine 
following this prescription they laid the old birds in a row on a warm blanket sufficiently elevating their heads and covering them up to their bills and left them to sleep and sweat after the most approved hospital practice and now having done their duty by the living they went outside to look at the dead which were if possible more beautiful than ever the sun was unusually warm and by this time everything was dripping and glittering in the light which was half blinding and the thin ice was snapping everywhere as the lightened limbs sought to regain their natural positions as to the dead fowls a few had fallen to the ground but most of them remained rigidly perched on the great limbs dripping a shower of raindrops upon the ice below here and there where a few rays of the sun had found passage to a particular limb a section of the icy coating had turned so that a half dozen fowls hung heads downward or the casing of a hen had melted while her claws were still frozen fast leaving her to lop over against her neighbor for support by afternoon they began to fall off the branches like ripened fruit and drop on the ground with a thud like apples in an orchard on a windy day it was a dismal sound in the ears of the three soldiers and a sad sight to see the heap of dead fowls as they accumulated on the ground the military training of these young men had taught them to make the most of every reverse and if possible to turn defeat into victory and so they fell to work and plucked off a great quantity of soft feathers and all the next day was spent in skinning the breasts which they would find some way to cure and make into covers for their beds or even garments for themselves a portion of the carcasses they tried out over the fire and made a brave supply of oil for the mill and then the poor remains were thrown over the cliff the six old roosters remained alive in a crippled and deformed condition some having three stumpy toes to a foot and others two or one on which they wobbled and limped about with molting feathers and abbreviated combs the most dismal-looking fowls that can be imagined the old yellow patriarch was paralyzed as to his legs and thighs so that he was nearly as helpless as a tailor's goose and had to be set about and fed like an infant for the five red ones bromley fixed a roost in the corner of the house behind the door where some of them had to be helped up at night and where they crowed hoarsely in the morning over against the window of the stained-glass flag philip in pursuance of a brilliant idea which he kept to himself selected a dozen of the new-laid eggs which they happened to have in the house and put them away in a warm place where no breath of frost could reach them when the first warm days of spring came he made a nest of corn husks and feathers on a sunny shoulder of rock into this nest he put the eggs he had saved and covered them with the old paralyzed yellow rooster who had never been known to move from where he was set down since the night he was frozen on the limb the indignant old bird certainly gave philip a look of remonstrance as he left him in this degrading position and when philip came a few hours later to feed him this cunning old rooster strengthened perhaps by his outraged feelings had in some way managed to turn over so that he lay on his side on the rock his helpless claws extending stiffly over the nest as often as he was set back he managed to accomplish the same feat when if left on the ground he would sit for a week where he was placed as stolid and immovable as a decoy duck the loss of the fowls had left an abundance of corn for planting but when the warm days came after this trying winter it was a queer sight to see the three soldiers walking about the top of the mountain with their five sad roosters wobbling at their heels End of chapter twenty